any data solution cannot exist just as a certain, you know, code. It will die. It will probably not be employed as well. It will not bring as much value, especially data science, right? It should almost always come as a package solution for the internal users to enjoy, right? And to benefit from. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today, we have Alyssa Kim. Alyssa is the head of data product at Vestier Collective. We used to work on the same team in Machine Learning Solutions Lab in Amazon Web Services. We have collaborated on projects before, and uh, previously, she was a consultant and has worked on analytics in investment banking in Hong Kong. She has a PhD in Econ AI. And she has worked on various industries and multiple continents. She's someone I really enjoyed working with. And uh, when I was at AWS, I was always happy when she's on a meeting invite. So today I'm really excited to talk to her about uh, her journey, projects she worked on, and lessons she learned. Uh, if you like the show, subscribe to the channel and give us a five-star review. Welcome to the show, Alyssa. Thank you so much for having me, Delana. Um, my team was actually very excited to find out that uh, we'll be having this talk. Apparently, you're fairly famous in Europe as well. So, oh, thank you. To share it with them post factum. Yeah. Uh, so, how did you get into data science? I suppose originally um, I'm coming through the whole data analytics bit, right? So, this is kind of the the classic, the OG uh, data science bit. Um, pretty much at the point when data science was becoming a little bit more mainstream in the sense of that, okay, we kind of already learned what the neural network is. Uh, around that time, um, I actually started doing my PhD because um, it was kind of very clear that in case you want to be serious, dealing with data, dealing with analytics, you kind of had to amp yourself up quite a lot. So uh, for me, most of the journey... Um, uh, started with the Humboldt University back in Berlin. Um, I did some of the basic master courses there. That's actually also where I learned my first programming uh, languages. I kind of dabbled in uh, in web development back in the day, but uh, it, it wasn't really helpful to learn R or Python. But um, the, I, th I, th I think this process of kind of getting yourself back into the programming mindset and... Uh, trying super hard to remember all the math that you learned, you know, back at school and probably already had a very good chance to forget. Suddenly it was very important for all the statistical models that you would be building, all the, you know, the, the math background that's happen uh, that uh, is quite important for, you know, proper data science to take place. So um, that was a fairly uh, intense kind of back to, back to basics for me. But, um, you know, the academic environment, I feel, is kind of the perfect um, perfect setup for it. Uh, in this sense, I also was, you know, lucky to actually be exposed to a lot of uh, super qualified, you know, professors and uh, uh, peers around me that uh, would, would be, you know, learning it with me and we would be exchanging the ideas. I think it's so much better than, you know, to be on your own, for example, when you come to data science through the massive online courses, for example, right, which are, which are absolutely fantastic. And I think they're doing a very important job of covering the first basics. But um, yeah, I, I got I got a little lucky there. I actually had a chance to, you know, do it uh, live, uh, surrounded by peers. Uh, I also even had a chance to teach it further mm -hmm. on while I was doing my PhD. That was also super gratifying. And this is where you realize that depending on where you do the accents, you know, data science as a, as an activity, as a professional activity can look in a very different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are di different uh, kind of points that you can focus on. So that was quite an exciting entry into the profession. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, so I'm definitely curious about what made you want to transition to uh, the head of data product and uh, what is data product? But before we talk about that, um, I'm curious about from your perspective, what was your experience working at Machine Learning Solution Lab at AWS? So the, um, 
position with the machine learning solutions lab was my first real position after mm -hmm. the phd right so while while i was doing it i i tried to work very closely with companies as as you mentioned right i was consulting in the berlin startup scene uh, there was still kind of a lot of uh, groundwork to, to to help with but um AWS, I think, is exciting for every person that comes in, right? Because it is obviously such a juggernaut, right? Um, the up to, up to today, right? Even post AWS, the um, the amount of accumulated experience. I almost want to say wisdom. It will sound a little much, but <laughs> at this point, I think it's not even overselling it. Wisdom yeah. on like, okay, what is what is a, a smart way to manage change? What is a nice way to organize a big group of people? How do we um, introduce, you know, new projects, right? Uh, how do we um, make sure our customers are happy? How do we even build the process of, mm -hmm. you know, getting new colleagues into the team? That was absolutely unprecedented for me. So even though, you know, it was not my first job, right? Uh, again, I'm, I'm coming before my PhD, I'm coming through some, you know, um, from from finance area and operational area and um obvi obviously aws is uncomparable because the the level of efficiency is amazing and for me i think the best part was uh the interviewing process funny enough you know the aws together with the big four they're so famous for the super rigorous super hard and long and scary a round of interviews mm -hmm. but um there are those, you know, value questions that you kind of get get asked about, right? So there are obvious, uh, obvious list of values, and mm -hmm. we have two more. And uh, that was actually the most exciting part for me because when I understood what the company is looking for, right? Because I, I read that, hey, you know, they're gonna try to make the leadership sure that principles. You are Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that, hey, they, they will want to make sure that you're aligned with this. I was like, oh my God, these are my people. <laughs> I am so aligned with this. Mm -hmm. So I was actually, you know, almost interviewing my interviewers. It's like, yeah, but like, are you living by this principle? I'm so yeah. excited to hear that, you know, you folks are mm -hmm. hearing about, you know, uh, delighting the customer or making sure that, you know, you're, you're productive with your learnings uh, and um, how you're handling failure, right? So the just you know the way the work is done and the processes it is like this was forming for me right it's like usually that's what school does for you for me AWS did it and obviously I adjusted this process a lot to myself and but I'm still using so many of this learning in my work and in this sense uh, uh, again without without uh, overselling it too much I'm I'm extremely grateful to uh, those years at AWS because. It was like a super duper fast, you know, MBA on how to. Yeah, you know, it does feel like one. Yeah, for folks for sure. who, are, who are curious what a leadership principle, maybe we can uh, give a few examples so they know what we're talking about. I think we have customer obsession. We have bias oh, yes. for action, meaning uh, we're encouraged to take actions quickly. And, uh, oh God, I think now I they're think like more than 10. Our ownership, ownership and the disagreement. Right. Right. These were these were really good. So ownership was kind of always super obvious to me, and uh, not every company wants it. Truly, uh, I would say that people who have ownership as strong principle with them, they're not always easiest to man manage, right? And the, you need to you need to be sure that they're kind of applied well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm coming from the family of entrepreneurs, so for me, like every company. I work for is the company I own, right? And I treat it as such. That's, you know, for me, it's very easy to make sure that there is no such thing as like, oh, that's not my job. So I'm just going to leave it to somebody. But then again, you know, it means that the person will be extremely proactive. And, um, you know, I think AWS did a good job kind of putting it into use, but that's not a given for, for everyone else. Um, but also disagree and commit. I kind of didn't know how to name it. You know, there's, there's this, expectation from you know organization or your team or mm -hmm. yourself that you know even if you're not aligned you will still be productive about it and i feel that there is no way to really call it so it's kind of you know a little bit in the air so putting this into a leadership principle was actually very valuable and up to today i, I am using it when i'm trying to explain you know situations mm -hmm. um or for my managers or for my team 
Yeah. And uh, this, I think, is also like one of the keys to productive uh, collaboration, especially when you are surrounded by very strong individuals, very smart teammates, probably smarter than you, right? Uh, so as in, in AWS, you know, one of the other things apart from lovely processes and leadership mm -hmm. principles were an absolutely amazing bunch of people that you would get to work with. Uh, I would I would imagine you you kind of felt the same, right? It's a very, very specific circle of amazingly talented individuals that you just get to collaborate on a daily basis mm -hmm. or even if you're not in the same teams you know you reach out and uh, you can you know exchange information or just chat and have a coffee you know this is this is definitely kind of a very warm memory and it's something that i, I truly enjoyed um so yeah for for sure these are these kind of you know the the cor corporate perks mm -hmm. these were the perks for me right there yeah. there are not so many you know, cups and hats, frugality mm -hmm. principle strikes again. Uh, but um, for sure, like to 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 get a little bit more serious about the actual technical uh, work that I've been doing for 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 the machine learning solutions mm -hmm. lab, right? So I was I was a data scientist and then a research scientist. So uh, I think the exciting the exciting bit there, obviously, was all the amazing companies that we get to work with, right? Because AWS is. Uh, very, very present, not just in the States, but also in Asia and in Europe. Then actually the results of your work that, you know, affect um, thousands. Uh, I don't want to say millions, but maybe hundreds of thousands of people for yeah. sure. So you need to be very, very cautious with what you're doing, how you're arriving to certain decisions, the alignment with all the stakeholders. I can highly recommend AWS to, to anyone um, at any point in your career. I feel there is so much to learn and so much to contribute to mm -hmm. on a larger scale. So yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. So can you tell us what was your day to day like? Um, so or say, you know, we are working on project with AWS customer, how does the process look like? Your day-to-day -day probably different in different stages of your project. Right. So um, for, for us, particularly in the lab, we always um, would meet with the customer already when a lot of groundwork is done in the sense of that, uh, right, the whole, the whole role of the machine learning solutions lab is, you know, we are catapulted uh, into the, the, the field where uh, some advanced data science is needed. So uh, in case there is a big customer of AWS that um, is not necessarily struggling, but willing you know, to really expand uh, the horizons uh, with the way they're dealing with AI, right? how they're integrating uh, maybe some complex ML in their organizational processes, but they're not quite sure if it's going to work, how to do things uh, right there. They might not have, you know, um, a super big data science team and they are, you know, swamped with something else. Um, then uh, Machine Learning Solutions Lab would, would come in and put together a proof of concept, right, a POC. So usually before we arrive, there is a lot of groundwork that is done by uh, the lovely, lovely business development team that figures out, okay, what is the problem? Is it indeed a data science problem? How can we help? Can we actually, right? So when, when that is already cleared, then we usually get involved. I always try to be, start being part of the process a little bit earlier on because to me, it was always absolutely fascinating about how different the data science project can be shaped depending on what actually gets highlighted in the process depending on who is in the room right like which division are you talking to or what is the actual position of the person that is driving the engagement with aws this can take a very different you know shape size complexity level and etc so the i feel that now more and more companies are actually realizing that when you say oh i would like to you know to have a data science solution or a machine learning solution in place this is this can take you know a million different forms and you need to be very cautious so i would be you know um there uh, ideally from the very beginning asking them you know the questions okay so what is the pain point where can we help have you like what is the history what was tried how exactly do you expect it to affect your business right because ideally um you only invest this time uh, and money right on on any side when it's something that's really going to be making a big change uh, mm. for your company. So when that is cleared, we would uh, try to make sure that, you know, the task is very well scoped and then we'll start working, right? We usually have 
um, the person who is responsible for the project, so the, the lead data scientist here, uh, if you wish, had a chance to lead some very, very exciting uh, projects with AWS for nonprofits and for right the, 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 the multinational corporations. So they, they kind of suffer from similar complexities, but they also enjoy, you know, um, the fact that they usually can uh, benefit from some really bright minds that are working for these organizations. And uh, it's exciting, of course, to become part of the team, uh, basically, for, uh, for several months. So we will start putting together the machine learning solution, which is usually taking the shape of a model, right? So, for example, a natural language processing model that allows them to classify um, a document, right, as, um, um, as, as, as a specific financial type, right? Um, we, can, we can put something like this in place, and then there is usually a certain MLOps around us, right? So machine learning operations, which means um, all sorts of pipelines that supply the data into the model, maybe pre-process it a little bit. And then uh, there might be some extra layers before it actually outputs, let's say um, a class number or a, just a, a prediction. We would also try to put together mechanisms that would allow the customer to watch how these models are performing, right? Because, uh, and again, this is another very important point, I feel, for many companies that are um, applying data science solutions, they're never static, right? So what I, what I keep seeing is that, okay, there was a solution, it's now running, it's been four years, everything has changed around it, but we're still relying, you know, on the same poor model workers to, to give us a certain number, right, or perform a certain action, but then maybe it's already not really reflecting and understanding, rather, it's not really understanding the reality very well and its predictions are no longer available. So what are some um, challenges you face when you work as a consultant, kind of work with external um, customers? I think it's almost always the expectations. The public sentiment was like, oh my God, so like so many problems are going to get solved right now. And if most of the businesses that were like, oh my God, we need to hire a data scientist. And then I think there was a massive, massive disappointment wave where uh, we found out that actually it's not that simple in the sense that not even the, the models, but the actual application of data science that would give you some palpable results in your business performance is actually fairly hard to achieve, right? And I'm, I'm now obviously not talking about the companies or the startups that are solely centered around the machine learning solution, right? But the time when I was working with the companies uh, back in Berlin, this was exactly the beginning of the, or rather middle of the disappointment wave, I feel. Mm -hmm. And it was actually very exciting for me because I kind of got the idea about what's driving the disappointment fairly fast, mm -hmm. right? And uh, this was actually the realization that further led me to um, be very proactive and remodel the entire business analytics course, which is basically the Starters Data Science course with the Humboldt University. I'm extremely grateful to my, my professor who actually allowed me to, you know, uh, bring in a lot of my thoughts uh, and changes to the course, because I realized that, you know, what mostly data scientists are focusing on probably will have very, very little value to absolute majority of the companies that are just now trying to start using data science, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's almost never about the actual model, you know, like for, for data scientists, the number one thing, you know, if you're asked, okay, so what is the main substance? Uh, in your work, you would say, okay, it's, it's a machine learning model, obviously, right? This is the working course. You build a model, the model does stuff, right? So uh, classics there, but it's almost never about it. And I feel that the model building and the actual training of the model is usually 10%, maybe. And at, uh, in the university, they tell you, oh, uh, you know, the model will be, you know, half of your time and then half of your time is going to be the data preparation. You know, we've been already preparing that we're going to have to invest a lot of time in data pre-processing because the data comes messy, data comes unreliable, all the joys of big and not so big data. Uh, but actually, it's, it's the stakeholders communication that takes absolutely most of time. And uh, it's the actual impact estimation that takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And because it's not something that one data scientist can do while sitting at the computer, um, the, 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 the results, the output is not what uh, business or, or business owners expect, right? So a lot of my 
time and a lot of my work actually went into the integration of data scientist unit, the creation maybe of data scientist unit and integration of this unit into the business processes. Because I feel what also happens very, very often is when data scientist is hired, there is a chance that nobody in the organization knows what, what this data scientist is doing, right? And it's actually a little bit complex to manage this person and to make sure that this person is actually, you know, realizing uh, if uh, his or her potential and self-actualizing in the company as a data scientist and bringing value, right? So is it analytics? Is it, is it DevOps? It's kind of a little bit bizarre. But then even when you have a unit, right, and you have some very, very smart data scientist that's leading this unit, right, uh, without proper and very, very focused integration of this unit in the processes, the output will be a fraction of what it can be. Right, because I feel that data scientists themselves, for quite clear reasons, they don't always have maybe even an opportunity to get really engaged into okay, what what is the process that I'm dealing with? Obviously, they try to you know learn everything about where the data is coming from, what is the task, what's like what's the business problem I'm solving. Although again, I feel that not everyone is asking themselves that question. Maybe just because there is not enough time, or they don't know who to ask, and etc. So just, you know, building this connection and saying, hey, you know, you're building a model. Who is actually affected by your work? Yeah. Have you talked to them? Do the people that will be consuming your model, do they understand what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Are they on board? Have you talked to them what to do in order to address their concerns? For example, because, you know, people that don't know that much about data science, for example, but they know their processes very well, right? Or they're coming from the business side and they're worried about the bottom line. They have the full right not to trust the data science solutions from the get-go. Why would they, right? Again, we're talking about the, the beginning of the, or the middle of the wave of disappointment. So there, there is a whole set of actions that have to be undertaken in order to get all your stakeholders on board. Otherwise, your absolutely genius model will never be applied just because your stakeholders don't trust it and they're not comfortable using it. Unfortunately, it will go to waste, right? The, the infamous POC graveyard that even the lovely uh, big uh, companies like AWS has mostly happens because there is no alignment among stakeholders. Yeah. So for me, it was almost always about talking to the management, okay, where do they feel is the main problem? And then untangling, okay, where exactly is there not enough communication? Where exactly there is not enough alignment? And then usually, you know, the process kind of flows nice and well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you brought up a, a great point, not just in AWS. I think a lot of data scientists are facing, sometimes they develop the model or some solution, but it's not used. And I talked to a friend recently, and he told me sometimes they have to sell really hard to uh, the business. Hey, we build this model for you. You need to use it because this is our KPI. We measure how many models actually go into production. And a business is like, yeah, it is useful, but it's not our you know top priority. But okay, maybe I can just put one in production, just do you a favor. So uh, there are a lot of situations like that. And uh, there wasn't alignment in the beginning. The data science team uh, is like a central team. Sometimes it's separate from the business team. They're not talking to each other. They're talking to their own data science manager, data science director to come out with the use case. Um, so yeah, I think you brought up a great point. And I think that's a great segue to talk about what made you want to transition out of AWS and into your new role. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a personal one. Um, I think I was um, uh, very curious to see what's out there, right? This is, this is, this is the, uh, the wonderless sentiment that I feel every, every employee of a big company gets sooner or later, yeah. however he or she yeah. happy, uh, however, however happy we are. And um, there were, I think, two main bits that really enticed me to transition. First of all, um, I was an avid user of the Vestier Collective as a product. Um, so the company uh, itself, just as a very uh, brief uh, uh, intro for those who, who is not familiar, um, I think it depends where you're from. It will be kind of an obvious, uh-huh, 
or 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 a head scratch. So this year collective is a platform for the um, resale of fashion items, usually clothing items. And the main idea behind the platform is the fashion circularity, right? And the, the green economy. So the whole uh, point uh, in the very beginning of our two wonderful um, founders, right? Fanny Mozan and Sophie Hirsan was, hey, you know, we all have closets where clothes are dying with a slow and painful death. Why not, uh, you know, give them another life oh. and maybe sell it to somebody and why not buy uh, an item that was, you know, born pre-loved uh, instead of buying something new given that you know the fashion um has this kind of not so nice image of being one of the you know biggest polluters um, um in, the, in like among uh, other other industries so um the kind of the purpose really really spoke to me uh, right and um, i really enjoyed the process of actually doing this exchange um, and uh, participating actively in the, um, in this community. They have a really vibrant community there. And there were certain things that I felt didn't work very well. And actually, at some point, I got upset about, oh, what was it? I think I lost my expert seller badge. And uh, I've been talking to them, to the support, and they were like, hey, we can't do anything. It's an algorithm. And this is where, you know, my, my data scientist heart was like, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> let me help you. And uh, that, that's how actually the whole the whole process started with the company, and we got into it. And um, the the whole data product department was actually created with my arrival to the company. I think they they felt the need a little bit before, and I kind of fit nicely into the into the equation. Um, I am I will be absolutely tooting my own uh, my own uh, horn here, but I am in love with the data product uh, idea because. Um, it answers to uh, it solves so many issues that I've been observing, right, in the consulting years in AWS and etc. And this is data science or or any data solution cannot exist just as a certain you know code. It will die. It will probably not be employed as well. It will not bring as much value, um, especially data science, right? It should almost always come as a package solution for the internal users to enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. And to benefit from. So it's not just like, okay, like here we, we put together a model, it's running, you know, now the data scientists are busy with somebody else. Now the unit that got it is kind of hoping that the damn thing works and everyone is just, you know, pretending that everything, everything is fine and moving on. Uh, almost every data, data model, and I'm sure, you know, we witnessed it more than once, this kind of, I will sound very, um, very dramatic here. It's a living organism that has to be nurtured and yeah. developed. And uh, uh, then it will, you know, serve well and the impact will be, uh, will be much bigger and much more thorough. And uh, because of the overall stakeholder story that I've just been, you know, tell it, telling in such bright colors, it has to be presented and if you wish, sold internally as a product, mm -hmm. right? Because... Um, a huge part of my job is actually, you know, talking to business and talking to product teams. And um, I'm almost always trying to refrain from persuading them to use something that we have. I really want, every time I really, really want, you know, to say, oh, come on, this is such a good model. <laughs> why don't you, why don't you apply it? It's obviously <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Don't you get it? And this is what actually happens in most of the companies, right? It's so non-clear to the very, very smart data scientists why their super duper cutting edge model is not, is not in use. Why, why is nobody, you know, mega excited and celebrating and they're not, you know, given a huge bonus uh, for it. The model might be amazing, right? But it unfortunately doesn't exist in vacuum. And as data scientists, we are very prone to want to develop something, you know, new and sexy and throw in some transformers and some, you know, uh, single shot learning and everything, every every new bit that is out there and uh, and make sure that, you know, we got, we got, we got the most recent stuff uh, running. Um, unfortunately, most companies are not there and you um, indeed have to be very t in tune with, with your users, right? Because again, a lot of my time, for example, goes into understanding, okay, what will make you comfortable and um, what, what will let you be 
calm about integrating this model. And by calm, I mean, I really don't want my stakeholders to feel like they're taking a huge risk and doing me a favor by implementing a model, right? Or using something that we developed. Ideally, we don't start developing until everyone is on board, right? And that's another big, uh, big, big bit that um, ideally always has to be taken into consideration. So ideally, your data science team doesn't start until you've got, you know, all the priorities and aspirations and problems in line. But then even, even if that's not the case, it's very important to put yourself in the shoes of, of the users, right? The model might be amazing, but they are not supposed to take your word for it, right? The point is, what do they need to see to be able to say, hey, you know, actually, I would be confident to tell my manager that this is a good idea. I will not have to, you know, uh, have troubles with my sleep because I think it can break any day and I do not understand what I actually allow to be part of my business process. And um, I, I don't want to worry about the fact that actually something will break and I'll never find out because everything is working under the hood, right? So these are very important things that as data product, we need to think about it for, for our customers, which is the internal company, right? Um, again, I can't say that I am um, the, the, the absolute, absolute goddess here, right? I think very, very often I kind of fall into the old ways of like, oh, come on, you know, uh, like, the, like we've been discussing it for years. Why, why, why aren't you, right? Mm -hmm. So ob obviously I have the sentiment, but um, it's very, very helpful to when I when it, hopefully, you know, I build the relationships with my stakeholders and for them to actually tell me we really, we, like, we can't do that. Sorry, but like, you know, the business is not convinced, let's say. And I appreciate that they're saying that, right? Because then I know what to, like, what to work with and where to help. And uh, the frustration changes into in engagement and empathy in a way, right? Because uh, it is my job to explain what exactly is happening. Why will it create the impact? And there are sometimes such basic things as like, just put a document together and, you know, describe what exactly is happening and describe what are the risks. Be very upfront about the risks and potential drawbacks, right? And, um, that that is kind of the fun part of, of the data product, right? So you're treating it very, very differently. Your goal is not to develop the best model. Your goal, well, I have absolutely amazing, super genius data scientists that are working with me and that's their goal for sure. My goal is to make sure that this work actually gets, you know, recognized, applied and makes a difference. And then obviously they can be, you know, hopefully satisfied uh, with the fact that, uh, you know, what what they're doing daily actually uh, bringing in a big change. Um, there is a whole different aspect to it that I think is not necessarily part of my daily job, but that I'm slowly starting to notice more and more. And it kind of brings me, so do, do stop me here, but it kind of takes me to the whole um, different realm that I think will be the next wave, right? So we had a wave of excitement, we had a wave of disappointment, we're now hitting the plateau of productivity. Mm. And I think the next the next bit is going to be the the heels of responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> which is, um, which I think is already kind of happening in certain areas uh, of application of data science that are very sensitive. Right. So we all kind of hear about the cases when AI was biased against, let's say, a certain group of users, or when the model that was developed actually not favored a certain segment of, of, uh, of data points, right? And um, the, the bit that I find absolutely amazing with every data project is the lovely, lovely question, what are we optimizing for? Mm. It's, it's, it's the question that sometimes really puzzles business right? Um, uh, also puzzles data scientists sometimes because to them, the answer may be obvious or non-obvious at all. Every model, when you train it, you choose what are you training it towards? Does it have to be super duper accurate in getting the right number? Or does it have to be maybe not so accurate, but it must not uh, label, you know, what positive, label it as negative, right? So it, we want to minimize the number of um, false negatives because that's the key 
And I feel that there are so many basic constellations there. You know, like when you predict a price, you usually want to be accurate with, uh, you, you want to accuracy, right? So you want a super accurate price. And we actually had a very specific, it's, on, it's an ongoing discussion uh, in my teams. We are doing, uh, we're trying to estimate the price, right? So when you're a user and you want to list your item on the platform, you want to sell your Gucci bag, right? That's a favorite example for everyone, mm -hmm. your Gigi Marmont. Uh, when you're going to list it, you're going to provide us with the attributes of your bag, and then we're going to recommend you the price that most likely this item will sell for, right? And then you can follow it or not follow it. Uh, it will have certain implications. You're entire, it's entirely up to you how to set the price, but we would like to at least give you, you know, a, a goalpost, right? What we think it's going to sell for. And this is one of the oldest models that uh, Vestir Collective has. Um, and it's part, part of my scope, it's pricing. It's extremely exciting mm -hmm. as a, right, with the economic background, when you get to deal with this basically behavioral economics, it's yeah. absolutely amazing. But what we're now debating is like how, how important accuracy is. Because we can be at accuracy of 20, uh, like 20% 20 error, or we could be at 15. Does it make a difference or not? Because for example, what we are discovering is it does, like, it, it matters. We want to be cautious, but actually it's much more important about how users perceive our, um, how our lovely sellers perceive our price recommendations. Do they trust it? Do they not trust it? Actually, the platform allows you to do price drops. It allows you to haggle with other users, right? So you can make an offer to somebody, discuss the price. There are so many other things that can happen after you chose how you want to price your item. So the adoption of price is actually a much more important component for us. And it's not obvious, right? Because if you casually throw it into the conversation with business or with data scientists or with whoever, most probably they will say, hey, you know, it has to be accurate, right? So almost every data science project, my absolute favorite thing when I'm, you know, encountering a new model or talking to the new team, like, what are you optimizing for? And very often, surprisingly, not in this year anymore, but um, very often you find out that actually business was not involved in this decision making. Yeah. Because, you know, there are some, there are some basic metrics that are obvious to choose. But maybe it's not aligned with business goals. But nobody knew about it. Again, you know, I'm circling back uh, to my Kakadu uh, topic of communication and engagement, but it actually has such palpable effects, right? So um, I, I should like give all the credit to our business teams at Vestier. They're like very involved and they're always, you know, doing their absolute best to understand what exactly is happening behind. And um, they're, they're there with us brainstorming, okay, like what do we want to achieve here? Right? But very often what happens is the data scientist team is told, we need the pricing model, develop one. They develop one, it's running, things are happening. Are they going in the right direction? Are they not going in the right direction? Who knows? Yeah. Nobody's talking to each other. I think that's a great point you brought up. I think there are two set of metrics. One is the data science metrics, accuracy, precision, recall, whatever you call it to measure the model. And there's also a set of, business metric, like you mentioned, it could be um, how many people are using it? Are people happy with the results? Or if people buy something, are they uh, returning it? Sometimes data scientists are not paying enough attention to, or sometimes they know those metrics matter, but they struggle to translate those business metrics back to their model. And I think a data product on the surface, it sounds like a fluffy word, you know, kind of businessy. What is it? Uh, but I think I whether you're building a data science a model, machine learning solution, or even a dashboard, you are building a product or a data product kind of free data scientists from focusing on a specific technique because our job is to help the business to solve problems. So in some cases, maybe you don't really need a machine learning model. You can build a dashboard and that can solve the problem. And that's, just that's like actually you, very true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And like you mentioned, you have to also talk to the business and monitor whether, whether there are changes 
in this dashboard. It's not you build once and it can live um, forever. I'm really glad there's uh, this type of data product roles in your company. And for other data scientists who live in an organization where they don't have a um, data product manager or you know, p- product manager to help them, how can they build a data product better themselves? That's a very good question. I, I've been thinking about it a lot, actually, um, because obviously doing you know, doing the back and forth. And it kind of sounds straightforward, you know, just discuss your KPIs with business, you know, just map your metrics into the business metrics. <laughs> oh my God, the amount of time it takes. So it's a luxury, right? So I, w- I would I would go for a very, very um, forward to say that it's a luxury to have somebody who can do this legwork, basically, for you who would have the right amount of understanding of what you are doing in order to right. broadcast it further and make sure that everything is in place. Um, I think the advice that, that I would have is find one friend in among your stakeholders that you feel has, you know, the most interest in what you're doing and, um, that you can focus on and that you can invest some time in getting really aligned with it can be, it can be, you know, your product lead. It can be the project manager um, in your in your general data team, right? Maybe it's a BI person. So anybody who is your stakeholder, so whose work you're affecting with what you're doing, and um, get them to question your processes, and get them to question why you're doing what you're doing. This is my second, no, this is my number one favorite question. What we're optimizing for? My second favorite question why we're doing what we're doing, uh, my, my first favorite question. So have somebody ask you constantly why you're doing what you're doing, because it's very, very easy to get lost in the exciting process yeah. of machine learning. We all been there, mm-hmm. but to ask you like, but why do, why do like get them to ask you un- unpleasant questions, but why do we even need that? Right. So it can be it can be your peer. It can be, you know, some uh, manager from another team, wh- whoever is interested enough to have this conversation with you, um, get them to challenge why you're making certain choices. And um, if if the, the your time investment is actually going in the right direction. So at the very least, you know, have a weekly with this person. And I feel that it will already help you to get a little bit out of you know, the cocoon. I, I also like want to, uh, want to, want to kind of say that it's impossible for data scientists to be outside of the cocoon, right? It's, it's a very intellectually heavy work to do it properly. Yeah. And of course you need to focus. Of course you have to be, you know, in your, in your corner, just messing up with your stuff. You can't be good without it. Yeah. But that is why I feel that it's almost always the responsibility of someone who is not the data scientist. So maybe data science manager, data science lead, right? Or somebody else in data to, you know, knock and knock into the window and say like, hey, you know, let's have a coffee and talk about your model. This is important, I think, for organizations to recognize. But the the effects, oh my God, the motivation of the team, the impact on the business processes, the actual alignment among teams, if you do that. I was actually... um, it was such a happy moment for me. I actually had a business team advocating for one of our data science model in one of the meetings to, you know, a third party. And they did it better than I would do ever. And this was like, yes, yeah. <laughs> this is this is what I'm talking about. This is the alignment to I, uh, I've been dreaming about. So, right, because they really understand and like what, what is in place and what they're working with because they were such an intrinsic part of creating it. Right. So the, the, the payback is amazing, but in case it's absolutely, you know, impossible for someone to do it for you, just get this one person, you know, get them to question what you're doing, exchange ideas, and it will already help to, you know, slightly broaden their perspective here and, um, and, uh, hopefully result in you actually, you know, getting, getting better return on investment of your work. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And I love the, uh, two questions you mentioned. Um, and also going back to our AWS days, I feel 
part of our job is actually doing some data product work. Now you mentioned what you're doing. Um, because we didn't have product managers for a specific project. So it's actually on the data scientists or research scientists, supply scientists to talk to the customers. Um, sometimes we talk to the engineers to deploy the model. And we also talk to account managers. So sometimes the customers are not super engaging. You want to ask, hey, is there something changed? Um, but like you said, there's a challenge because we do need to spend a lot of time doing technical work. And you have to take a lot of meetings, do a lot of calls. And um, this constant context switching sometimes is a little bit uh, challenging for data scientists. I think especially someone who prefer to have more alone time to do work. And uh, so it definitely will be helpful if there's someone who understands data science and machine learning, someone like you who has a background, uh, deeply technical and also have good communication skills to, to help. Um, but yeah, I think if you are a data scientist working um, organization, you feel like you're doing everything, um, you can talk to your manager about how do you allocate your time. Maybe you can communicate okay, those are the four hours a day. I don't want to take meetings and then um, communicate to your team and uh, um, so they can respect your time to do, uh, to do some uh, deep work. Mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky balance to strike and it's usually one way or another, right? You, you usually have either a super secluded data scientist that... Uh, doesn't talk to anyone except for, you know, his or her manager. Yeah. Uh, or you have a very distracted data scientist that is hating the fact that 50% of mm -hmm. the time goes into meetings. Yeah. It's, um, it's a tough balance to strike. Uh, it's been definitely in the center of my attention, especially for the first months um, after I came. And it's kind of been a very, the, the, for, the formation months. Um, because um, actually my first, my first reaction was like, um, you know, to the teams like, folks, I will shield you from everyone. I will make sure that you have the time to work. You know, I had, I had that spirit and team very quickly explained to me that it's a wrong, <laughs> wrong messaging. And um, again, I, I understand it's very individual, but um, um, I'm, I'm very, I'm very excited about the actual uh, amazing, you know, mix of professionals that we have because they were mostly eager to be more exposed in a productive way, right? So I think one of the bits that as a feedback I would receive later on is like, hey, actually, it's so helpful to understand why I have to put this model that way, yeah. why I am, you know, throwing out this data or limiting, you know, certain factors and why we now have to, you know, do things differently, right? So. Mm -hmm. Very often, another another radical state that you can fall into when you know you're talking to everyone, you're coming back to your team, and you're giving them just the information that you need to do the work, right? It's also not good, right? Because then they cannot truly. My my my, you know, I said my favorite question: Why we're doing what we're doing? So I constantly, not constantly, but at least once a month, you know, I double check. Folks, do you understand why we're doing what we're doing? Yeah. And if the answer is no, then I didn't do my job well, right? They have to understand why is this a priority? Who are we doing this for? Have they met these people? Mm -hmm. Have they talked to them? They should be in the meetings with them at least once a month. They should meet their stakeholders. It's much more personal. It's much more motivating most of the time. So it's, it's important to strike the right balance here. And this is something that I'm still learning, again, thanks to my team being very open with their feedback. Um, and I think my, uh, my, my managers being very supportive in me, you know, taking time to <laughs> strike the right balance there. So um, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting challenge to solve. Uh, again, I'm very far from saying that uh, this is the exact right way. Uh, depending on your organization, you might find a, a different scenario you're working. But I would definitely always offer the opportunity to, for, for the data team to be engaged with their stakeholders because it, it's, it's helpful, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it can only be helpful. Yeah. 
So if I understand correctly, the data scientists on your team are exposed to those discussions with the business. Um, they're aligned, but the more time consuming, the legwork are done by you. You're doing really? more, uh, maybe you're trying to put the discussions in the document, specify what is the business metric. You actually make those process more aligned and uh, uh, playing a role kind of between data scientists and the, and the business. And also um, probably think on a higher level from the company's perspective, what is the business? What is the goal? Um, I think it's a very fair uh, way to describe it, right? So my responsibility is to make sure that I have all the right information to do the right prioritization, mm -hmm. to maybe suggest the right decision. Um, I'm, um, and this is, I think also for, that would be so for any company, I have to be very proactive, right? Because every unit has a ton of work. Every unit struggles with their own struggles. Every unit has a roadmap to, to, to you know, conquer and the, the KPIs to show. And that's kind of a funny aspect here. Um, you would think if you have a data science unit, people will come and ask for help. That almost never happens. <laughs> this, this is just not the case unless you are very much out there as, I don't know, head of data science, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, we have extremely well-connected head of data science, by the way. I've never seen it uh, to be so kind of well-established before. So kudos to, to my lovely colleague. Um, unless people know that it exists and who you are and what you can do, they, they, it's, it's hard for them to reach out. They don't know what to ask for. They will be solving their problems with, the, I don't know, with operations the way they know how to solve them, right? So it's going out and actually seeking data science solution is really not obvious and it's fine and it's understandable. And that is why, right, the data science units almost always have to reach out and say, you know, we could do this, but for that, you need to understand very well what's their problems. Because if you build a model that doesn't match their problems, then they're not interested, mm -hmm. right? And when you're, when you're uh, talking about the times with AWS, this is actually a fun transition. AWS is famous for delighting the customers, right? And yeah. we got all this training to delight the customers. Yeah. I am trying to basically extrapolate that to my company mm -hmm. and delight my customers who are the you know, internal units, the product units, the business teams, uh, the operational teams. And uh, I have to be very proactive and I have to make sure that I understand very well what's happening and what is the pain point and when is the right time and when is the wrong time to, to approach them and make sure that I keep them updated. And that's also a lot of work. But then when the right moment is there, at this point, you know, I'm bringing over my team and I'm saying, look, we, all, we already, for example, have that, right? So by the time I'm asking my team to put together a solution and suggesting them to consider something or brainstorming with them on a certain problem, I already have an idea what is the roadmap and what could be the problem and etc. It's not always perfect, but this is, you know, the, a certain uh, position to strive for. But definitely, as, as you pointed out, um, at least at a, with a certain frequency, data science teams Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I really like the example about the pricing project you, sh you shared. Can you share some other data product you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. So um, pricing is definitely um, a very big uh, chunk of it. We also recently got a much more active with image recognition. You would kind of expect it from a company that is so visually intensive, like the one that sells luxury, <laughs> luxury items. Um, it's, it's really non-trivial, right, to integrate something like this in the, in the existing processes. So we are now, um, for example, hoping to um, drastically change the process of listing. So at the moment, it is manual, right? So you upload the picture, you write in. Uh, you know, this is my Gucci bag, this is the dimensions, this is the condition of it, and etc. And uh, the hope probably will be in 2023, stay tuned. The hope is to just, you know, snap a pic and have it ready to, to go with, uh, with most of the attributes pre-filled for you, for you just to accept them, right? This is something that I would love to see as a user, so I'm being very driven, 
there, but um, we're obviously trying to make sure that uh, you know we're kind of doing it as a um, um, in the right way so that it actually increases uh, the usability rather than decreases. We're also now trying to get uh, much more active with nature language processing, which is my original field of expertise and that mm -hmm. I'm very excited to finally, you know, get to work with. Mostly the NLP is um, something we see in descriptions, right, of products and um, something uh, that we can get from the discussions between customers. We're not too active there yet, but hopefully, uh, hopefully very soon. Uh, there is a number of other models that's been developed that are like working for a while already. And they're mostly models that have to do with risk management, right? So for example, one of the biggest value adds of this tier is the fact that they validate the items. So you can, when you buy something very expensive, you want to make sure it's not a fake. So you can actually choose to send it to the STR collective warehouse. They will, the expert there will sit with it, valid, like evaluate it, make sure that, you know, it's as described and it's a real item and then you know, forward it to you. Take some time, but this way, you know, you can be sure that what you're buying is nice. Um, nice and real so um even even before that happens when the people are just listing their items right there is a curation tool that analyzes them and can already do some preliminary estimations uh, on whether this item might be fake or not so we also have model in place to do that um there's a number a number of others uh, right we're we're very uh, data science rich in this sense but uh, then you know Every quarter uh, in the discussions with, with the stakeholders, again, you discover, oh my God, there is 10 more <laughs> we yeah. can do. How do we prioritize it? And it's quite exciting also because, um, again, I was lucky. I didn't, I didn't come to the company that had no data science, right? There was mm -hmm. a lot in place and there was a lot of trust already earned. And I could, uh, I could, I could build on that. So that obviously made, made a big difference for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm hoping that I made it, you know, even took it even further and, um, it's, it's much more important for me to make sure that every model that we actually put into production, you know, we have, we have the happy customers rather than stressed customers. I am holding my fingers crossed that we we're not going to be evaluated by the amount of models in production. Yeah. I would be, uh, I think, I think it has some obvious uh, drawbacks here, but rather the, um, the, the, the amount of, I don't know, happy users, uh, in a way. So, um, I'm very much hopeful that we can further expand our, our model zoo and uh, get even more uh, specific there. Also, um, the project that, if you remember, we both uh, originally uh, worked on, I think it was the first project we collaborated on causal inference, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going yeah. to deeper math here and deeper econometrics. Um, I'm also hoping to integrate it in our A-B testing team. So oh, A-B nice. testing is another data product mm -hmm. that we have. Apart from pricing and image reco and tracking and product analytics, uh, A-B testing is, a, you know, an, an intrinsic unit for any company that is testing features, right? And I'm hoping that we can, you know, kind of up our game probably also sometimes in, in Q1 of 2023 and start doing some, you know, really deep and complex analytics on our marketing campaigns, on our A-B tests and et cetera. So fingers crossed, <laughs> we're going to put it in place. Yeah, that's very exciting. And uh, so you previously uh, mostly working as a data scientist, research scientist, and has a PhD. Now you're moving to the product side. Do you miss uh, writing code and doing research? Oh, my God. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can tell you, I don't miss the 3 a.m. in the night and your model breaks that <laughs> I do <don't> miss, mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure. Of course, but um, I am trying uh, now to kind of, you know, uh, cut out at least four hours a week and uh, maybe experiment with certain things, right? Because obviously, if I am challenging my team, you know, to get better, ideally, I should be at least on the same level with them with my mm. understanding and, and expertise, not in every area, uh, but at least in my <laughs> core areas. And I'm trying to experiment and I'm trying to kind of stay uh, up to date there. Um, I'm also trying to kind of be not too arrogant. And I'm just directly asking, you know, all of our data science leads, so like, <laughs> what is new? <laughs> can you, uh, can you share what, like, what are you reading? Again, um, I feel that a lot of uh, time was invested into making sure there is the information exchange so it's easier for me. 
but it's definitely a shift. And in case you like to be an individual contributor and in case, you know, the code is where your happiness, the data product is probably, or the data product manager, right, is probably not for you because it would be a lot about the, the communication. But I think for me, it was an easy transition because, you know, when you find out that you're good at something, you really, really want to apply it, right? And I found out that, hey, I'm actually pretty good at building the, you know, the, the communication bridge between different stakeholders, technical and non-technical. I can really make sure that, you know, certain things are happening. I have a lot of ownership over the processes, so I can, you know, make sure that we get to the right completion points. It also takes, you know, a certain skill set. So it was easy here, but I'll be honest with you, it is also coming with um, with the fact that I am perceived less and less as a technical person. And uh, I would not be surprised if I have to, you know, explain myself at a, at a certain point to maybe some somebody new in the company yeah. who would tell me, but do you know data science, by the way? And I'll be like, yes, <laughs> let me write some code for you. Um, and it's it's non it's not obvious that you're technical if you're yeah. a data product because people kind of forget data and right. they focus on and um, for me it's a it's a it's a painful moment because it took me so many years to do the transition from business to tech yeah and now, you know it's kind of slipping away a little bit mm -hmm. but um, I just have to you know remind myself that. You know, you got to you got to do what brings you joy. You got to do what you're good at, and uh, if if you're gonna be labeled differently, well, and then you know, then you just sit down and discuss algorithms, and hopefully, you can change this person's mind if it's so important to you. <laughs> so uh, there are there are different ways around it, so to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and after you were so long in the tech field, I think it sometimes become part of your identity and uh, you have this pride uh, of being a technical person. So yeah, I can see why it is painful. So when I was working with you, I noticed you have very good communication skills. And now you mentioned previously you worked in the business side also for quite a few years. I think it makes sense. And also you worked in different, you have lived in different continents and different culture. And can you share how did you develop your communication skills? That is, uh, you know, a little bit on like how, 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 how you're walking. Um, there is actually a very, there, there is surprisingly a very simple answer to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel that it's described in a gazillion of different books uh, in different, in different for formulations and in different phrasing. Uh, in a very simple words, I would be, uh, I would be, I would formulate it as uh, figure out what people worry about. Different uh, business, uh, different positions in the company, different groups of people, they, there are different things that give them anxiety and there are different things that give them a feeling of certainty. And uh, I'm now not talking about personal communication. It's obviously much, much deeper and much more diverse. But when you are working within a company, it's almost always about these two questions, right? The, whenever, whenever you're, for example, reporting to your management, there, there, I feel, I feel, I feel it's always such a, such a complex matter to most of us, to me as well. You, you know, you, you then evaluate yourself after the conversation and you're like, did I do well? Did I not do well? Do they, do they not think I'm stupid? <laughs> did, I, did, I, did, I, did I deliver my thought clearly enough or not? But the point is, we are almost always thinking too much about how, how we feel and what we would like to say. But our, our, our counterparts do not care about that, right? So if you're talking to your manager, most probably... All your manager is caring about is, is there, is there, is there something, is there a fire? Is there something he or she has to do about it? Or can, can they, can they like relax and have a feeling that everything is going fine and just deal with the gazillion of other problems that they're dealing with? That's it. All, everything else is details, right? And that is why it's so important how you deliver information and what you're focusing on and what you're not mentioning, because sometimes it's not, it's not useful, mm. right? When you remember... 
and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I will be repeating myself a little bit, why you're having this meeting, right? So not why you're doing what you're doing, but why you're having this meeting, why you're communicating certain information. It's almost always not about the information. It's almost always about either creating a feeling of certainty or communicating risky situation that calls for action. And then you want them to do the action. And if you start thinking about it in that way, actually your communication will be much more crisp, much more to the point, and much more efficient to all parties. So again, the, you know, the, the usual question that I think also would emerge in, in AWS, when you have a problem and you're writing email to somebody or you're having a call with them, just start with what's the ask. What do you want? From? Don't tell the story of your life. <laughs> just tell them exactly what they need, what, what you need from them. And then it's going to be much easier, you know, for your management or if, especially if it's top management to say, okay, do you need that? Okay, fine. Is it going to be solved? Yes. Moving on. People are these days, you know, complaining a lot about the meetings taking so much time and, you know, it being emotionally draining and 80% of my days, my day is meetings. Mm. I thought it would change, but it's been seven months and it hasn't changed. Yeah. But I, I kind of love them because at this point, I think we managed to find the right pace and I'm always trying to go for, okay, I'm not in the meeting because I would like to, you know, deliver a ton of information and show them what a fantastic job I did, which of course I really want to show everyone that would listen. Yeah. But they are there to, you know, make a conclusion about a certain process that is part of their job. And their job is probably also, you know, reach certain goals and not hit certain icebergs. Mm. That's it. So if you kind of reverse it a little bit, I feel that then it gets easier. So it was kind of with some, with some examples and et cetera, but boils down to, you know, what is the anxiety and what is the, you know, certainty state of the person that you're talking to? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like the uh, two points you uh, mentioned. So can you share, how do you find out? I mean, I'm pretty sure you're not just asking, you, Hey, what are you anxious about? But this is, I mean, some of it is experience for sure. Mm -hmm. So almost always top management is same everywhere. They worry about very similar things <laughs> across the industries. Mm -hmm. So you, you can infer. Uh, sometimes, of course, there are like very pecu like peculiarities in communication, but you can learn it, you know, in, within the first couple of weeks on the job. Yeah. But you can actually ask, but just not in those, in those words, right? Mm -hmm. But when I'm meeting new stakeholders, I'm trying to uh, figure out, okay, what, what is your roadmap? You know, what are your goals? Mm. Um, like, what's the teams that you are working with? I'll probably already know, like, who's the manager of this team. I will figure out what are the main pain points, right? I'm trying to be informed around what's happening in the company. Um, I, I'm obviously going to tell them what, what are my goals, right? Because I would, I would love to, I would love to communicate that too, but it's, it's really straightforward. People, me including, right? We all would like to talk about our problems. So it's really not the information you have to pull like teeth. Yeah. It's just something that I suppose you just need to hear. That said, again, um, uh, I, I had a discussion with one of my uh, teammates uh, recently, and she's been telling me, we've been discussing actually the communication style. And this teammate would tell me like, yeah, you know, but yesterday I really didn't do it well. I was like, like every third time <laughs> my communication is not what I'm preaching it to be. But, you know, I try. I, I know what it should be. And as long as you at least try to keep it in your head, you know, one one out of three is gonna be better, and maybe on some of the weeks, two out of three, and then you know, hey, your 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 former colleague is being very nice and telling you that they like your communication skills. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a yeah. little bit a little bit of external orientation, I suppose. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I think I like the question. You can start with what's your roadmap? What are your um, goals? And then you can just really pay attention, listen to the things they talk about. Or sometimes when people really care about something, they will talk about it repeatedly. And that's really something you should uh, take notes of. I think we give a lot of information e either verbally or from our nonverbal communication. And I think what's important is, are you paying attention? 
like you mentioned, yep. do just want to talk about your own problem, showcase your work, how amazing you are, or you are actually listen to what the other person is talking about and taking notes. And uh, uh, previously during our chats, you mentioned after you joined a company, um, you really made an impact um, on building the data product. So I'm going to give you a few minutes just to tell your colleagues who are listening how awesome you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I received, I had a birthday recently and I received a candle that says, you know, very straightforward communication. We appreciate you. <laughs> so I would like to believe that, you know, my, my colleagues know they're, they're awesome like that. Yeah. Um, but to, to be honest, I really, um, as much as I would love to take credit, you know, to organize certain things. And sometimes it's just connecting the dots. So it's been real pleasure because everyone was very open to, you know, what I've been trying to, to preach for. And they were open to try out different modes of work with me. And uh, this is not easy. If I was them, I, it would be hard for me. There is some person that's coming and saying, hey, let's try to work a little bit differently in mm. that area. And, you know, it's, it's hard for everyone. And it takes a lot of maturity and professional like self-assuredness to say, okay, let's, let's give it a go. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it takes, it takes both sides. So I was fairly successful with the goals that, you know, we've set because I had the support of management, because I had the understanding of the team, because I had the support of my peers. Um, and that, that kind of happened that way. So organizationally, um, we changed quite a lot. Right. So we had, uh, I think, a data science team that was working on projects, but I feel that it's much harder to improve the recognition of that work when you're just like one big team. And it's not very easy for your for your company or for your stakeholders to really say, ah, that team actually, you know, did this work. So I think the shaping of the data product actually allowed uh, the teams to get much more visibility across the company. Everyone in the company now knows who's responsible for pricing, right? So it's our pricing lead and the team that's doing this. Everything that is happening in the area, right? So for example, we build a new component for the ranking system, which a gorgeous sales probability. It has a massive impact on the way consumers are now discovering, or right, buyers or sellers are discovering products at Vistier Collective. And we made sure that this impact was recognized and visible in the company. They could, like, the, the pricing impacts the conversion a lot, right? So the, the, the pricing accuracy, but also the adoption that improved further, it had, it had effects on how far, you know, how fast you can sell your item. And if you're selling your items fast, then you would want to list more. And then, you know, we're building this one wonderful consumer base. The number of solutions we developed that replaced third-party solutions that are obviously very costly, almost at all times, right? Data science still costs a lot of money. Is is like I'm already can't can't count it on 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 the hand of on the fingers of one hand, right? So this this obviously have this massive financial effect. That's not straightforward because again, you the company learns to rely on this third party and then persuading them to consider something internal mm -hmm. is not straightforward. Almost almost never is. Like the A-B testing was, I think, massively influential, right? So the the company was kind of experimenting with different ways of doing that. Now there is one A-B testing pipeline that is man managed and developed by the team. There is one approach to this across the entire company. The amount of tests that we did, I think it grew tenfold at least. Wow. And the way we're now processing this test is so much more, you know, holistic and reliable so that 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 was a massive change for the company that you know develops a dozen of new features every quarter so this is just you know some of the most obvious bits that changed but then you know there are so many operational processes that just got much more efficient can you give a specific example of what type of processes um, you have implemented or what are some procedure you have introduced so to give just one example that I think is it makes it makes uh, makes a good one because it's so obvious, uh, but uh, it's something that actually made a big difference. It wasn't existing before, is um, a dashboard. Super straightforward, but um, our pricing solutions were previously uh, implemented. Right, they were working. We're providing the price price recommendation, and then we would have weekly meetings 
actually meetings didn't even exist. I started them as data product um, with the business team where we would say to them, hey, you know, this is how we're doing right now. This is what our accuracy looks like. Uh, this is what we're planning, right? So it was a certain accountability for the business team. Uh, and then at a certain point, it was very, very clear that actually there is no one source of truth because they've been calculating their KPIs and we were calculating our KPIs on the performance. So we were saying that we have accuracy X and they were measuring accuracy Y. We were using KPI on MIPD and they were using something entirely different because it made more sense to them as business. And we would constantly exist in these two different universes when we thought we're doing fairly well. Mm -hmm. And they thought we're doing okay, but these KPIs are not looking very well, right? So it's super straightforward, but it just takes a lot of work to reconcile, yeah. right? When you have several teams working on something. So we actually invested a lot of time. And here again, big thank you goes to the business team who sat down with us and worked through that. We created one dashboard that can be shared from anyone and analytics, uh, you know, our management, whoever you call from tech, from business, it shows the same set of KPIs. It shows um, different kind of aspects of the process, depending on which, which bit the person looking at it is interested in. And even more importantly, what we're working on right now is an upgrade of it, which would no longer require any personal visual evaluation of the graph, right? So what happens very often, and this is what I keep seeing and uh, also guilty for building dashboards like this, you have a line, let's say with your performance that goes up and down. And then what happens very often is, you know, people look at it as like, oh, it's going down. So it's bad. Something is happening. Let's investigate mm -hmm. it. Or, oh, it's going up. So we must be doing super duper well. This is the, not really the best way to interact with graphs, right? Ideally, you need to do a little bit more decision support when your, your dashboard should be telling you, okay, there is a drop of 10% which is totally within your seasonality or which is, I don't know, maybe caused by something specific. This is harder, but can be done. But you just can input some statistical rules that tells you if what is happening on your graph is out of normalcy or not, right? So this is already such a huge extra step because people look at the graph and they try to do their best judgment. And sometimes it's very hard to see that something is happening and say, okay, it's fine. You don't know, right? You're worrying. So actually to do this extra step of unifying it, of doing the decision support, this makes such a big difference for even establishment of the same understanding of the progress between several teams and actually saving some time on unnecessary deep dives or actually, you know, alerting the teams when something is happening. If you're reviewing this dashboard once a week, you know, maybe there is something in the middle of the week that took place and, and requires your attention. There's so much automation that can be done. We just never have enough time for this, right? But it actually really helps when you have a lot of stakeholders that all need to make a certain judgment on the same graph. And ideally, you all reach, you know, the same point because the statistics helped you with that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. You're obviously uh, very confident and uh, you mentioned previously um, sometimes your questions about your ability. So how did you develop your confidence? Uh, I want to say I did not. You just, um, I, th I, think, I think we never, uh, we never change really. If you doubt yourself, you will doubt yourself your entire life. You just learn to ignore the doubt. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think at some point you have enough past information to help you kind of, you know, not allow the doubt in and then, you know, it makes things better. So there is absolutely no, no way out of it, to be honest. Uh, you just need to learn to ignore the doubt. It's always going to be there, I feel. So previously we talked about how to take advantage of opportunities. Um, so... Some people say you need to make your own opportunities. Sometimes people say, oh, you need to be patient and wait, respond to opportunities. So what's your take on that? It actually, for me, kind of a very cool question. It, for me, touches a little bit what you just mentioned about the self-doubt. Mm -hmm. So dealing with self-doubt, dealing with uh, opportunities and et cetera, I will, um, I will sound just slightly, slightly new age here, but it's really all about knowing what works for you. So there is no, no podcast, no blog, no guru can tell you what's the best way around something. I feel you just need to get several opinions and figure out which one is good for you. 
So this is my, this is why my approach to, you know, oh, be proactive, you know, create your opportunity, move on with this, you know, carpe your diem. I like this expression. It's not for everyone. I know that it's very propagated. It's like propagated, you know, from business world to everything to tech. And uh, you're supposed to be the creator and the builder of your success. I don't think everyone should be. I was fairly reactive my entire life, actually. Um, it might not look this way from the side, or you know, but um, actually what works for me best is when I'm trying to remain open to, you know, what, what is happening around the world, uh, like around me in the world. And then sometimes when certain ideas kind of come in or certain things happen, I can choose to react or not react to them. So in case something is in the air, I might be interested and I might go on and then I could create something there, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. But it's almost never because I've been this, you know, pioneer breaking walls and moving on. It doesn't work for me. It actually is worse for me. Mm -hmm. Every time when I was too proactive, I would, I would end up being um, disappointed and, and upset and not happy with the way things went. Mm. Um, my, my advice here, if, uh, if like as, as we're discussing it right now, just like with the self-doubt, figure out what works for you. For some people, they can shed the doubt and just, you know, build the confidence and prove to themselves that they're worthy and that's going to help. Some, some people just need to start ignoring the doubt, right? It's a, di it's a different technique. Uh, for some people, the opportunities and, you know, they feel bad about not, you know, going to the gazillion and working events, you know, participating in ABCD and, you know, doing the things that you're told to do, right? Build your network, get the visibility, have yeah. an Instagram channel. I, I don't know what is. I, 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 would, I would not be able to do that. It would, it would make me miserable. Yeah. Am I missing some opportunities? Yeah, probably. But uh, I'm not quite sure they're the right ones for me. So in this sense, try to figure out, like look, look into your past and try to see the different situations when you reacted or when you acted. Maybe proactivity works, maybe it doesn't. I feel that unfortunately, we're living in such an, like uh, in, in, the, in the age of this aggressive promotion of proactivity and we feel bad about ourselves when we're not like this. And this is, this is not very good. The issue is, People for whom proactivity doesn't work don't write books or speak on stage, and they they don't they're not usually the ones that are screaming about it on every corner. So if, given that we're talking, you know, your your audience is probably very data science related, so your sample is biased. Yeah, do not trust your sample. People that are going out there and saying that speaking to people is good is like there there is a connection there. So um, this is something that I learned for myself, and I can you know. With the limited responsibility I recommend to somebody else, if if you have a feeling that um, this you know uh, wildly promoted uh, approach to life and to career development doesn't work for you, then you probably have the right feeling, and you should try something different. And this is totally fine. Uh, and find 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 the people that have the same outlook, and they, you know chat with them, and you know get get your inner peace with the fact that you just function differently. Yeah. Yeah, I like that um, perspective. So there are people messaging me, oh, should I also post a lot of things on social media and uh, have a lot of followers? So my question to them is always, what is your objective? What made you want to do that? Kind of similar to the question you asked. What are you optimizing for? Yeah, what are you optimizing for? <laughs> um, I think if that gives you joy, you really enjoy sharing, um, I think... Uh, that's fine. Or you want to find jobs. Maybe you can craft a personal website with a lot of uh, technical articles that can be helpful and you don't have to have um, a lot of followers. So uh, if you don't know what you want, maybe you can try everything a little bit and uh, you don't need to feel bad if you're taking a path that's different from other people. Uh, I really like what you, you talked about, the selection bias. The people you see out there are probably the people who are taking approach, who want to put them out there more. And there are probably also a lot of people who are happy and fulfilled. Um, they're anonymous and you don't know. Yeah. 
So um, I think trust yourself, trust your intuition to find out what do you um, really enjoy doing. And also pay attention to what compliments people usually uh, give you. I think, I assume you'll probably get a lot of compliments. Hey, Alisa, uh, you're such a good communicator. You're good at that. And then you know that's your strength. And then when you think about making a change of your career, you feel comfortable to uh, take a bet on a new path. You're, you're, you're quite right here. I would actually add to it that um, for, those, for those of your audience who even want to take extra step into complexity is um, the way you feel about yourself, what you're good at, mm. can be actually very different from what people perceive what you're good at. So um, just asking like those that you trust, maybe that, that you work a lot with, like, what do you think is my, is my strength? You might yield very unexpected results. Yeah. I haven't been complimented for communication for most of my career. So it was not an obvious <laughs> strength. I feel it is something that indeed kind of got developed uh, with time. Um, but because, you know, it was, it was an unusual way. So also, you know, it's always helpful to separate, you know, your inner feeling about it and what others see. And then when you when you actually get it clear, it might be even easier to further improve if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get feedback from your nearest neighbors, like the algorithm. <laughs> yes. yes, now you're talking. <laughs> Um, and uh, we previously also chatted about different communication styles in different culture. I think that's uh, like a fun topic, uh, for example, for Germans, Russians, Americans, and also how people react, uh, communicate on Zoom. Uh, would you like to share uh, some perspective there and give us some examples? I think I would start with uh, try to make sure that there is no, not a single colleague that you have that you only talk by text and never see each other live or at least by Zoom, because I think 100% of people seem, uh, especially in crisis situations, much more unpleasant than they are uh, if you just talk to them directly, uh, quite possibly because of the amount of information we get from the nonverbal communication. Uh, when it comes to Zoom, um, it's a broad topic because I feel that apart from the cultural uh, specificities, mm -hmm. there is also now different cultures in online communication. And um, again, when I just joined, um, people would be late to the Zoom calls all the time. Yeah. And this would drive me insane because... Everyone has very limited working time. It's not like that long. Actually, there are a very limited number of hours. And it would, I would always think, how can they, how can they be so disrespectful towards my time? Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I would be late, because, you know, I'm, I'm preaching being, being on time, but things happen and sometimes I'm late too. I feel extremely bad every time because I feel that I'm violating, you know, the preciousness of their of their time that they're spending on waiting on me and i've been told hey you know you can't change it that's that's the culture yes you can you can uh, very softly very consistently ask people to consider an alternative uh, an alternative approach um, again uh, my colleagues were extremely nice and they un understood why it's so important to me i tried to be very open about it I am now actually the, more of my energy is going to keeping myself to, you know, the standards that I asked for, because you do, you do get, you know, lost, lost in the process, but you can, you can work with the, any culture. You can try to explain why it's important. And I think if you're respectful back, um, usually like nobody wants to feel, you know, that their time doesn't matter, right? Usually people are fairly open to be, uh, mutual uh, with this kind of better practices. Uh, when it when it comes to the uh, like, I want to say almost national uh, communication uh, traits, it is something to be aware of, but it's not something that I feel will will break uh, anyone's neck in the sense of if you're open in your communication, you might you might cringe sometimes from certain approaches, right? I've been told many, many times that, you know, oh, Germans are so overly direct. They are so sometimes even rude because they just say what you mean, mm -hmm. what they mean. I did not encounter it at all 
And I was like, wow, maybe I'm just working with such polite Germans, which I honestly, I were <laughs> working with very polite Germans. But then what I did not take into consideration is Russians are actually even more direct and rude. And that's why I wasn't really feeling the effect yeah. <laughs> because I'm on kind of another, another side of the spectrum. But the things that you still, um, like there are, there are certain traits that you just forced to learn, right? So for example, and again, I will touch a very kind of sensitive bit here, because, uh, like in the, I don't know, male and female styles of communication and what different parties are allowed. Regardless of your gender, for example, in Europe, losing your temper is never an option. It is never an option. It's an absolute no-no. In a number of other countries, it's actually fine. And it's it's the way to communicate and it's actually even seen as sincerity, mm. right? And and it's, it's, it's a whole different story. And people might be experiencing, so if you're having an argument with your colleague that's getting heated, people might be very uncomfortable because for them, it means that you are fighting while you're just exchanging opinions. So it's just something to be aware of in case communication is indeed a big part of your work as it, as it is for my, of mine. So I am usually trying to be extra sensitive to how I express myself because I know that it will cost me a lot of extra effort to change somebody's opinion of me in case I managed to cr make it a little bit crooked with the way, you know, I spoke or et cetera. So it's, it's a little bit bothersome but it's worth the attention. And um, I think it's actually very enriching to be, to be honest. It took us some time to, I think, get really good at um, speaking with our uh, American colleagues, but um, it's, it, it, it has so many benefits, right? So you're basically shaking up the unspoken rules of communication this way. And it brings up a lot of stuff that should be discussed, but wasn't. So it's always super duper helpful to have, I feel, people with different communication styles, whether it's coming from the national background or not, in, in, the, in the team, right? So this is like, we're now circling back to the values that diversity matters because then, you know, you don't get, you know, five people who are politely silent about a very big crisis that is currently happening because they don't want to, you know, sound upset or something. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that. And uh, I'd like to kind of go back to the point you mentioned on Zoom. For example, if someone's late, I was going to ask you, for example, if I'm a colleague that I'm kind of always late and you said you can politely reinforce some boundaries, so for example, what would you say to me? Um, I try to never say that in the beginning mm -hmm. of the of the meeting because then I'm actually angry. Uh, and I will probably not speak very well. And you should never say those things in anger, right? Because then you're just emotional instead of productive about it. So I would usually already when everything is done. And again, we're in the call, not for me to express my emotions. We're in the call. I'm, I'm sometimes I say that in the beginning, again, not perfect, but I try to always be productive. And that is usually when you're already cooled down and the meeting is mm -hmm. over and you already discussed everything that has to be discussed. Like, you know, for me, it's really important to start on time. I feel that it's a very good practice. I would like to be respectful to your time. I would like to be treated the same way. Would it be possible for us to do it differently next time? I'm happy to send you a notification or I'm, I can set the meeting to slightly earlier time if that's an issue, or we can move the meeting to the other part of the day if, for example, an early morning yeah. meeting is, is, is not good. So I would try to come up with a certain suggestions how this can be treated, right? So the important bit is to always go for like, this person wasn't late because he or she disrespects you personally. Yeah. <laughs> That's almost never the case. So it's just because, you know, there is a lot of work, people are busy, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to watch it. I was so, it was actually hard for me because I grew so reliant on Chime that calls you two minutes before the meeting. It was so convenient yeah, back in the day. To give folks an idea, Chime is an internal messaging tool in Amazon. And you can also use that to do like Zoom calls. Yes, thank you, indeed. Um, and the Ch Chime would ping you two minutes before your meeting right. starts in order to kind of, you know, get your attention and you can finish your calls. Yeah. And you can be on time. Mm -hmm. So for example, Zoom or 
um, Google Meet. It, I think it can do that, but not always. It's not really a given functionality. Mm -hmm. So I fully understand when people really have to like keep track of this. Uh, and also, you know, like things happen and that sometimes I'm just asking, can you please drop me a line in Slack if you're late and then I can wait, you know, the amount of time that you need. It happens. Sometimes you're stuck in the meeting, right? You also also have to be reasonable about it. But um, I think I think it's really wonderful when you can like agree on, you know, a certain set of interactive rules and then everyone is kind of happy because I'm pretty sure it's important for everyone that their time is carefully considered, yeah. right? Yeah, that's so thoughtful. I like that you, you mentioned you don't communicate those things when you are in certain emotions when you are actually angry um you talk about it when you're you're more calm i think that's uh, good for yourself and also good for other people i think they would probably really appreciate that and uh, i can so resonate with the, the the chime notification i really want someone to message me separately instead of you know when you get on the call they can choose the option oh i might be two five minutes late hey i'm ready here <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. True. but I um I wish we can we could have have this conversation earlier so I can communicate to this person. But I just feel frustrated. It's like uh okay, fine, you know. Um, I yeah. think you, we can also check in with ourselves if you feel frustrated. Um, you can always communicate. Uh, doesn't mean you have to yell at this person. See if you can politely uh, just let them know this something frustrate you, and then you want to respect their time as well. So yeah, now I feel bad. I think I was like a minute late for our recording. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I recorded it. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know there is always the five minute grace period. Yeah. So you're good. But I <laughs> that that's very very kind of you. I I expect uh, before we drop the call, you will <laughs> give me a little <laughs> talk. A <laughs> talk. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, but this is actually i think this is definitely a learned skill that took me a lot of time uh, and stems from a lot of bad experiences so uh never never react straight away when you're upset yeah i i, I cannot i don't yell but i am very emotional mm -hmm. as a person actually and um, if i am in like anger or in frustration I know 100% of time I'm not going to come out, you know, gathered and calm and productive. I just know it's not going to happen, yeah. even if I try really, really hard. Uh -huh. So I would always regret speaking up uh, about my frustration later on. Yeah. Always, 100%. So I think at some point I finally, you know, learned. And I was like, okay, okay, breathing out. We're going to yeah. talk about it later. And yeah. then it's it's much easier. Yeah. So again, like yourself in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of us also sometimes kicking ourselves for not speaking up for ourselves. So sometimes it makes the anger worse. Sometimes we feel, oh, are you not respecting my time? So I think it's also important to make sure you do speak up whenever you feel uh, frustrated, right? Doesn't have to speak in anger, but you do need to advocate for yourself. Otherwise, like you mentioned, other people might not realize you're actually frustrated um, yes. because you always Absolutely. tolerate this behavior. Basically, you're quietly training them that it's okay to be late. So you exactly. don't care. You, you, sometimes exactly. I just have this reflex whenever people do something late or forget to respond. My email is, just, oh yeah, it's okay. And then at one point I realized I should stop saying that because it's not okay. Um, and I need to let people know in a, in a nice way. I think if you know, like you mentioned, if you know, I'm, oh, I am going to stand up for myself. I am capable of saying things like that. Maybe like later, you are also, um, help you to be more productive, uh, to getting the call or discuss, um, just on the work side, professional side with this, um, person. So knowing, um, you can do this or you are going to do this. Also, I, I, I feel like they also give you confidence. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's, it's a big part of it, right? So you need to have the inner, like inner certainty mm -hmm. that you can handle this situation kind of in a nice way and you can deal with it. Yeah. So now you have a, a work on so many interesting like industries and projects um can you share 
What are some mistakes you made in your career? Funny enough, I actually think we touched on uh, on several bits uh, and pieces uh, here and there. I think one of the first things is you should never expect that somebody will have the same view on a problem and uh, guess what you are feeling about this problem and what you're thinking about this problem unless you're very, very clear about it. Mm. So most of my big mistakes, I feel, are almost always coming from me not... They were not like, oh my God, I pressed the wrong button and the system collapsed. You know, they're almost never about that. Yeah. It's, um, it was always like, hey, I systematically behaved in situations in a way that well, like, wasn't right for me or wasn't right for people around me. And it was not good, right? I regretted it, for example. And it's almost always has to do with, um, for example, inferring that, hey, you know, others, they tell you something that hurts you or something that you don't like or something that makes you doubt yourself. It's almost never about you. <laughs> You need to always, 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 always remember that people, even when they talk to you about you, it's still about them. Mm. And you need to like take 30% of it and try to distill the right amount of information and then act on this. Because what, what would happen to me, especially in early years of my career is I would present something and I would not get the right response. I would not be praised, for example, or... I would be praised, but not in the way that I wanted to be praised. Or, or I would actually be told, hey, this is total you know, nonsense. And I would be so upset. I would associate myself very, very closely with my career. I still do. I'm still working on this one, <laughs> by the way. So those of you who have advice on how to do it better, I would love to hear it in the next episode of The Data Scientist. Like I'm, I'm very, very closely identifying with who I am career-wise. Mm. So it hurts you a lot when something is going wrong in the company when your manager didn't give you enough recognition or if your team did not react in the way you wanted to react uh, them to react you know to a certain announcement let's say you did and it's been so painful through these moments in in my career and it, it i feel that it hurt me much and it called for the reaction of mine that was not adequate and that probably hurt other people when i expressed it and um, i think one of the biggest learnings was that Whatever happens, like, do not make everything about you. Yeah. If your manager didn't like your presentation, it could be a bad day. It could be a bad mood. It could be just like he doesn't like this font or she didn't, you know, like the way you offered information just because this is not what she read in the most recent book, that the way it should be presented. So the fraction, and this was the crazy realization, again, super late, I feel, in my career, I'm now, uh, what, just turned 30, 30, 33, mm -hmm. so it's this fairly late down the line. Um, I'm like, oh, it's actually, like, the amount of it that I should take personally is, like, barely 10. I would even say 10%. And when you realize that, and when you de start decoupling, the way you're capable of reacting to whatever is happening at work, however people are handling your project, however your project is being developed, were you fired, hired, promoted, non-promoted whatsoever, it actually, you can handle it in such, in, in a much more productive way. You can, you know, be okay with the developments. It, you won't let it affect your personal feeling of self as much. It sounds like very far from professional life right now, but I, I actually keep finding out that many people have the struggle that they associate themselves with their professions and whatever is happening in the office this is like their self-evaluation as a person, yeah. especially younger professionals. Mm -hmm. I feel it's very much uh, in there. So for me, this was like the, for sure, the mistake that I was doing. And now I'm still not there, but I'm much better. Yeah. It's, uh, we're, we're definitely progressing. Um, and that, that make a very big difference. Mm -hmm. And I think it allowed me to have much more joy from my everyday life yeah. and try things that maybe. Like it's extremely hard to try new things because you're not quite sure if you're going to be awesome at them. And you like feeling awesome because then it gives you, you know, nice positive reinforcement. Yeah. So if you manage to decouple yourself from this need to be, you know, affirmed in your awesomeness, you know, your options are wider and it's, it's much, much nicer. 
so that, that would definitely uh, be be one of the things and it's kind of very closely connected to another uh, professional learning which is how to and we, we kind of touched on it right how to be recognized without absolutely dying for the need of being recognized mm-hmm. right it's it's a little bit hard because it people will never evaluate you the way you want to be evaluated almost never because it's so much in our head and we design this careful intrinsic structures the way we want to be perceived and recognized and valued it almost never going to match. It's impossible to shed it, right? Because it's there. And, you know, for me, it was, uh, that's what we touched upon, right? So becoming data product instead of data, uh, data scientist and et cetera. It's been so important for me that people see that I'm tech and that I'm tech enough, <laughs> you know, because I don't have a, a computer science background. And mm-hmm. every time I talk about it, I feel a little bit, you know, a second class. I'm like, no, I'm not, you know, from, from comp sci. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, it's like, I need to tell something to people so that they still know that I'm smart, even though I'm, I am don't have a Just need to anything. add a PhD in your profile and your name. No, you know what? You would, you would think that it would solve the problem. It doesn't? It doesn't. Oh, wow. But you know why? Because it's not about the degrees, it's just what's in your head. Okay. So the big learning yeah. after the PhD was like, hell, it's not about the diploma. So I'm looking at the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. You know, go see the shrink. Uh, so... It's really like something that you better work through. Otherwise, you're going to keep trying to, you know, get degrees, PhDs and 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 certifications that not going to make you feel better. Yeah. Uh, right. So this is kind of um, another funny, funny, funny learning, maybe less, uh, less high level, mm-hmm. uh, but, but nonetheless. And um, I think I think the third learning, which is uh, much more career oriented and it has to do a little bit with the cultural uh, cultural background. Um, I think I still got my first, so my first jobs and my first years at work. Also, in, like IB is a very specific like area style wise, right? It's not startup. It's still very hierarchical. So I always thought that you know the good manager is a strict controlling manager that knows like exactly what's happening and you know is full control of things. And uh, I think, so at AWS, I was not uh, like managing the team, right? We would be creating these groups, right? Mm-hmm. That uh, we would lead, but it's not really a managerial experience. And I think um, I am very, I'm very happy that I managed to bring a much better version of myself as a manager to Vestir Collective because I came, I came to the realization that management is <laughs> really not about that. <laughs> really, really not about being in full control of, of everything. And um uh, I'm obviously trying to like uh, work very carefully with the feedback that my team is giving me or, or that my peers are giving me. It's uh, like I like uh, we, our, our colleague at AWS, if you remember, would, would always say, you know, feedback is a gift. Yeah. So I'm treating I'm treating it as such and I'm always trying to provide it back. But it's really hard to let go of it. But it's amazing what you can achieve leading the team or being part of the team when you let go of the being in control yeah. of everything mm-hmm. it's uh it's it's a whole different story yeah so uh, that's it's another fun <laughs> learning yeah i also was uh leading some teams i think that's also some initial feedback i got because you're so used to doing everything on your own when someone give you a piece of work you just want to go double check or you want to yeah. Ask them all the details. Um, so basically, oh. <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't really uh, trust them. You feel like you're taking a big risk, uh, letting other mm-hmm. people take those ownerships. But I think you need to take a step back and think about, oh, there's a reason I hired this person, have them on my team, and then you can probably have some. I don't know how you perceive it, but I think in the company, in the team, you can have some processes to catch. Um, some errors and mistakes, but you have to let people grow to take risks and make make mistakes. So, um, yeah. yeah, thanks for um, sharing that. And uh, so now you work with the data science team and the business side, you do the alignment. So this type of work, I assume it means usually there are a lot of uh, things that are not in alignment. And that's why you have to put them 
um, you have to align them. So that means sometimes you need to disagree with people or you need to make some proposals, suggest people to do things. So can you share, how do you, uh, it probably are two questions. Um, I'll, I'll let you decide how you like to answer them. How do you propose new ideas that other people might not agree with or, you know, or someone proposed something like you are disagreeing with it? Like what, how, how are you going to communicate that? So I will try to uh, now talk about, you know, the, the nice scenarios on my, on my good days. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That. Not, not always uh, following what, I'll, what I'm about to preach. Mm -hmm. I think with the, the disagreeing is easy because um, the, the main thing that you can do is try to understand why, what exactly is the reason for disagreeing. So there's no point in arguing without actually getting the full idea what is the disagreement. And even if it's not obvious from the beginning, you can, you can ask questions, right? Is it the uncertainty? Is the lack of trust? Is it actually too much risk? <clears throat> is it that there is not enough understanding, right? So sometimes you can't, you don't know about it and another team just doesn't really understand your suggestion because you didn't express it well or you didn't formalize it well or they don't have, I don't know, the technical background and it's your responsibility to deliver it. Yeah. So, it's about, okay, help me understand what exactly is your concern here. And you don't argue with this, right? Because if the concern is there, you know, you can't just say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, you, this doesn't fly. <laughs> yeah. You know, the classic, well, uh, I'm sorry you're upset. Yeah. It's your problem. So you, you try to go for, okay, help me understand. The openness to this already solves a lot of tension. And then you just try to advocate for them, right? So sometimes I have to agree that our solution is not the best and we shouldn't go for it. And yes, it will mean that, you know, we will not get to implement a model or that we will not get to tell management that we're super good and we did something, uh, right? It was the case, for example, with our recent uh, image recognition model, but it will help uh, build, build trust, hopefully, uh, with, the, with the teams that, you know, down the line, when you come back and you say, hey, you know, we actually addressed this concern and um, we, now, we now improve this, like, shall we try? And I feel that then people feel heard as, as we all like to be heard, right? Yeah. So when we disagree with something, it's because we have a concern. And if this concern doesn't get addressed, there is no way to continue the dialogue. Mm. It's not always ending with, you know, me managing to prove the point. Sometimes I just have to accept that, you know, the other party disagrees and, that, and there is a reason behind it and I understood it and I will work with this. And um, for, for, the, for the new idea, um, you always have to start with what they're going to get out of it. Mm. Nobody is interested in general ideas. Everyone is, like, <laughs> everyone is busy with their, with their stuff going on. Um, just the fact that your team invested hours and hours and hours in developing something and you really like the performance doesn't mean anything. Uh, unless you start with like, hey, this is why, uh, you know, it might be interesting. Let's talk for you. Let's talk about it. And then if it is indeed interesting, then you talk about it and then maybe you have a shot. This is, for example, the feedback that I'm giving the A-B testing team yeah. when they are doing a new release of the new pipeline. We're super proud. Three months of work went into this. It's all really complex to read because it's like statistical stuff and not everybody needs it. I'm like, okay, first lines of your email should be why people have to read it. Otherwise, nobody ever will because yeah. this is like not something that's like, oh my God, I better, you know, familiarize myself with the 10 updates of A-B testing pipeline. <laughs> not said no one ever. So always start, what are they going to get out of it with all your good ideas? The fact that they seem good to you does not mean that they will be, you know, good to somebody else. Of course, like if there is trust, if there is communication, it's easier. But it's still better to never infer that, you know, people will buy your idea immediately just because it's yours. So always start with, you know, we discussed last time your roadmap. You told me you have this problem. I think we have an interesting solution that would not require this, but would require that. Shall we discuss it or not? We would like to present it to you. And then usually this is hard to get out of it, right? Because it's your problem. You acknowledge that it's a problem. You acknowledge that it has a certain priority. So you will probably want to listen to it, right? Yeah. So start with what I need, not with you have, but with what I need, right? If I'm a customer so uh, or if I'm an internal customer. 
So um, I'm trying to always go through that uh, mm -hmm. kind of communication pattern, but then uh, yeah, sometimes I'm just like, okay, we already implemented this for you. It was good. So how about we also do this? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, nice. Yeah. Um, uh, it, 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 it really differs, but um, yeah. I think, I think this would be kind of the good, the good direction mm -hmm. to follow. Yeah. I like that. Uh, thanks for sharing that. And for folks who want to learn more about communication or broader scope, personal development, what are some of your favorite books that you like to recommend or like resources? I'm a huge fan of this super old uh, book. I think it's came in 97, if I'm not wrong, which is called, uh, which is written by Barbara Minto. Mm. Uh, it's, I think it's called The Golden Pyramid. In some versions, it's called The Golden Pyramid and McKinsey Principles. Yeah. And it basically teaches in a pretty good, concise manner on how to start with the most important thing and then go into detail. Most important, go to detail. One should never underestimate the, the, the benefits of executive summary. Almost never your audience will want to get more information instead of getting less information that's more to the point. Almost never. Like most of the time, I feel we're writing long emails because we feel the need to express some information, not because our recipient needs this information. So the, this book is pretty good at helping, you know, do the structuring. Um, I, can, I, can, I can recommend it to all my data product analysts and to, to all my teammates, big fan. There are no like real big speakers that I can recommend because everyone communicates in such a different manner, right? So you like, you need, find somebody that you like listening to, that you find pleasant to listen. Maybe it's somebody in your organization mm. and uh, try to analyze them, right? So which bits you could easily resonate with, which bit you didn't like. You can actually learn a lot by just analyzing your own reaction to what other people are telling you. Because we are all like like to be recognized and don't like to be you know diminished. We all like when we're being hurt and we all don't like where our needs are being ignored. So like in this sense, nobody's unique. And if you feel positive about certain way somebody talks to you, learn from that. You don't need to listen to a tech talk for it. So it's like fairly easy. You just need to be self-conscious about it like, or generally conscious about it. When it comes to general um, data science, I would... At this point, there are like no courses that I like. I feel that data science, it's, it's a hard matter, right? You need to learn it proper way. You need to do the coding. You need to ideally learn the math, etc. But the actual work beyond the model, how it's applied, how it's integrated, try to talk to industry professionals. Go to, go to the meetup and talk to the data science who are working in the industry and they will tell you a lot. Right, because unfortunately, no course prepares you to the fact that there will be no data and no ground truth labels, yeah, and no business requirement, mm -hmm. and it's just not in the course, unfortunately. So, if you're just a beginning data, like if you're a beginner at this point, uh, just either you know get a first job and learn there, or or talk to somebody who's already in the industry, because apart from the general skill, there is a lot that's rotating around it. But I would say that uh, for, for the data product, it's very much about the mindset that, you know, your, your golden customer is your company and you need to treat them as such and you need to be nice and you need to be patient and you need to put their interests as your own interests. And you need to really value and treasure your data science team because they're doing an amazing job, but they, could, like, they also have to be aware of the outside world. Um, so that would probably be mm -hmm. kind of the main guidelines that I can think of. Yeah. And uh, um, what do you think about the future of data science or data product? Unless it's a company that already has data as their product because they are like selling, uh, you know, data science as a solution. Um, I think it makes sense for most of the companies to start treating anything data science or anything data as a product if they want it to be actually integrated and used inside their companies. Because outside customer is no different from the inside customer, right? They're also, just because that you can force them to use something doesn't mean they're going to adopt it. So this is kind of an important uh, mindset uh, shift here. But um, 
if I am being a little bit more serious about the role of data product, given the development of the data science, I think it's going to be more and more important to have data science solutions, a certain separate unit with its own direction, with its own development plan, roadmap, and responsibility center and decision-making center. Because my expectation is that there will be so many more cases when it will be absolutely unacceptable to be less fair about what data science model is optimized for, which data is used, what is not. So it's going to get so much more serious about um, the decisions that are being currently made by a team of data scientists without much supervision sometimes. This is, I think this is going to change very soon. So there will be an absolute necessity that this team is represented and acts as a certain unit that has its own responsibility and it has its own accountability in the organization and possibly for the outer customers. Uh, so it's got, to, it's got to be a unit. It can no longer really be, I think, in the nearest future, just you know, a data scientist or a data scientist or a data mm -hmm. engineer. It has to live and perform and develop as a unit that monitors how the product is being created, used, developed, applied, and, and, and checks if everything is all right with it and bears the responsibility for it. That's so I am, I am expecting kind of even more, even denser units around every data science solution in the future because there is gonna be a lot rotating around the proper application of it. Yeah. And uh, what are you excited about um, your future? What do you see your career grow? Uh, I have no idea. And uh, I'm totally fine with it. Mm -hmm. I, I do not have uh, a three-year or a five-year plan um, with everything happening. Uh, screw that. I, I, it doesn't make sense to have that anymore. There are certain things that remain um, right throughout the years, which is, you know, invest in yourself, yeah. be, be a better professional. Given the fact that you don't know what your profession might be in three years, invest in soft skills, invest in your, in, and I'm sorry, again, preaching, knowing yourself, because yeah. whatever you do, you will probably enjoy it more if you know what works for you and what doesn't work for you, what types of interaction work for you, what don't, how do you want to grow, which type of growth, right, works for you or not. So this, these are kind of the meta questions that you want answered. And then however the environment around you develops, you'll probably be fine. So remaining open to what's happening and kind of working through yourself. And again, this advice only works for the people that are maybe similar to me in the way you're ticking and functioning. So yeah. everyone else, please ignore. If it resonates with you, then listen. Um, then it doesn't matter what you're going to be doing. I would not be surprised if I... And this would be wishful thinking if I don't know, I end up in aerospace in two years. Mm. I don't know. There is such a, the standard of the length of how much you're spending with every company. It's, it's shrunk unbelievably. Um, I don't know if you, if you, if you, if you remember, right. When you're, when, when you're making a decision about changing the company, I feel that even five years ago, if you spent less than three years in the company, it looked a little bit, uh, a little bit suspicious on your CV five years ago. I feel that these days, it's not even three years anymore. It's like maybe one year something. Yeah. And it's kind of understandable if you're in tech that you, you know, went further with something. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's okay. And it's not even like frowned upon anymore. Yeah. So the, the, the pace of it is unbelievable. And uh, I, at the moment, I'm super excited about the way things are developing and best here. I feel that, you know, the company is growing in a, in a very interesting directions, I'm given a lot of opportunities to really, you know, bring in the difference. As this is going on, well, fantastic. I feel that I'm in the right place, uh, right? As soon as, as soon as I stop feeling that I'm at the right place, you know, I'm not a tree. I'll change where I grow. Uh, it's as, as simple as that. Um, I, I don't want to oversimplify it, right? So I, I understand that, you know, the matters of unemployment and economic downturn are there. Uh, and not, again, not something to downplay at all, but, um, again, if you know things about yourself, you know, what's actually very, very important and what's something that you could sacrifice, there is a much higher chance that you will find the setup where you will remain, you know, professionally happy 
and will keep on developing. And again, you don't even know about the ways you could grow professionally in a year already. So um, I'm excited about the fact that I am getting better as a professional in the way I am treating work on every day, on everyday basis. And I'm excited that it will hopefully make my work life even more joyous, right? It's such a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working way, way, way beyond work hours very often because, you know, it, it, it gives me the satisfaction. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about the fact that the industry that I'm in is, is really like rampant and developing super fast. And I'm very, very curious to see uh, where it's going to go because it's been taking twists and turns that nobody predicted, right? Mm -hmm. So we were all so sure that, you know, certain, I don't know, the, the self-driving cars would already be there by now. Everyone was so positive. And there are there are so many political limitations to this, right? By the way, another lovely book uh, by Yuval Harari on the 21st lessons, uh, 21 lessons on the 21st century. He talks a lot about AI in a very dark tones, I feel, but very, very interesting about the like further applications of it. Um, so in this sense, uh, any, any, anybody who has an idea about AI on machine learning, I feel that we are already in a pretty good position. So keep developing a uh, very nice area to be in. Uh, but yeah, so, so many, you know, flavors that it can, it can gain in the upcoming years. It's exciting and it's kind of fun to watch. And I can only hope that, you know, uh, we will be on the, kind of on the right side of development in the sense of that hopefully nobody who's, none of the people who's listening to your podcast, uh, you know, will, will take part in the creating a big uh, negative, uh, like a big AI model that will affect negatively the society. And I'm hoping that we would rather do some very good things, you know, and be responsible data scientists. So that hopefully is going to happen. Yeah. So before we wrap up, who is Alyssa Kim outside of the world of data science? Uh, see, see now, now, now. This is this is the painful question that is so hard to answer for everyone who is associating themselves with their work. Um, I'm an um, I'm an avid um, uh, cook. Uh, I love Chinese tea. I'm semi-professional in that area. Uh, I'm a huge uh, board game fan. Uh, I'm a big uh, sci-fi fan. Uh, all the all the nerdy stuff that you know makes our lives uh, so much nicer is definitely uh, up my lane. Um, I'm a big cat and plant lover. I feel that uh, as soon as spinsterhood comes, I'll be very ready for it. I really enjoy being in Berlin. It's the city of, of my dreams. I'm super happy here. I can only recommend for everyone to visit, Stadana, you including. Um, yeah, I'd love to visit. I, I am uh, extremely passionate about finding ways. And this is like um, something that I'm hoping also to contribute, right? If we're talking about the future. Um, and something that uh, Harari is talking about, I, if I could contribute to people feeling meaningful and important in the developing world with the AI and with, you know, things changing so fast, uh, and I'm hoping to impact that through education, right, continuous education and helping everyone, you know, kind of realize themselves, if there, there would be a way for me to contribute to that. That would be a fantastic, fantastic cause to, to take part in. It's like education, edutainment, and gamification yeah. has been my passion. My passion for more than a decade right now. Um, I'm kind of trying to deal with this from the different aspects throughout my entire working life. There is a huge amount of training I'm doing inside the company and organizing because I feel that, you know, it, uh, it really helps people to feel, you know, the better professionals to grow. But there, of course, a much bigger scope to this in general, you know, about the people feeling that they're an important part of the developing tech technological society as well. So uh, this is the cause that I'm very uh, passionate about. Uh, but otherwise, I am um, also extremely excited to maintain contact with uh, many, many lovely people from the previous companies and, and across the globe. Uh, and it, it brings me a lot of joy to... Um, to stay in touch and see how everyone is developing because you, again, you know, you learn that there are so many ways to, you know, be happy and successful and they're nothing like your own. And that, you know, once yeah. again, reinforces the fact that you, know, you can just find your own way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah. yeah. Um, it's definitely, 
I would say sometimes very confusing, or you feel a lot of、uh, uncertainty when you try to find your own way. But it's also the fun part to know that you don't always have to follow a company's、uh, promotion guide. Going, keep going to the next level. You can try different things, change your title, or create your own profession. And、so. you're you're a wonderful example of it. <laughs> Thanks. And、uh, for people who want to follow your journey or maybe want to work with you, where can they find you?、Um, I think LinkedIn is、um, the absolutely best platform.、Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely not active on social media, particularly because because of the data science knowledge. I suppose <laughs> I'm actively opting、uh, opting out of it. Uh, but、uh, I'm also fairly open if you just、uh, reach out, even in LinkedIn. And there is, for some reason,、uh, that you want to talk to me or learn about something or share、uh, an idea,、yeah. uh, or you need an advice.、Uh, I'm extremely, extremely open. I highly appreciate people who,、uh, you know, just just reach out and ask questions. I think it's、uh, it's commendable and it takes a lot of guts. And、uh, please do that. I'm trying to be very responsive,、mm -hmm. unless you're trying to actively sell something, which maybe. Not going to be as successful,、yeah. but、um, if if you need an advice or if there's anything that I can you know support you with,、mm -hmm. I'm always、uh, super happy to do that、uh, because I on my own、uh, I think I received a lot of support、mm -hmm. from people that sometimes didn't know me that well. The way I ended up with AWS was three like four four different people that just like recommended me to each other without even knowing me very well.、Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to return the favor at any point. Oh, nice. I'm curious. Did you initially reach out to someone on LinkedIn for AWS? No, I.、Um, it, it's funny. It's funny that you mentioned because I'm already not even working at AWS, and the four guys that were originally involved in the process still hasn't managed to split the bonus they got for recommending、oh. me, and and gather for dinner.、Um, I got introduced to a person working in a totally different division in finance.、Mm -hmm. Um, by、uh, by my very close friend, they were just like they knew each other, and then I talked to this、uh, lovely lovely gentleman. He told me a lot about the whole thing, and then he recommended me to another guy who was a little bit closer, but that guy still wasn't there. I don't want to name their names in case it's、um, you know too too personal. And then there was another recommendation, and then this third person who recommended me to my、uh, former boss. And and he finally talked to me and says like, oh okay, that's actually a very good match. Let's start our interview. So it was, <laughs> it was not straightforward. Yeah, and that's usually how job searching process、um, feels like. So、uh, I really appreciate that you try to、um, pay it forward and want to help other people during the process. And、uh, it was such a pleasure to catch up with you, and、I、really appreciate you being open and、uh, you know vulnerable about your experiences and sharing、uh, your lessons in your career. And、uh, I will link your、um, LinkedIn in the、um, show notes. Absolutely, it was a lot of fun, Dalana. Thank you very much for. For the good time and for the invitation to your apparently very very famous <laughs> data science show. Thank you.